So welcome everybody. I hope uh, you could join without too many problems. And uh, I'm reporting here from the CMS control room. Before going into details, just a little reminder, we are registering this visit. So whatever we are doing or saying or discussing is that is registered. And for that reason, it's also not allowed that people ask directly questions or join in with video or so, so you're on the safe side. But you can, answer, uh, you can ask any questions by using something which on my screen is labeled Q and A on the bottom. So there you can ask questions which you write down and we will try to answer them without saying any names. That's all for data safety reasons. So um, after saying that, let me uh, introduce the team. So um, sitting next to me here, most of the time you will not see him, this is Zoltan. And then preparation, and preparation just behind me is uh, Noemi, which you could just see. So these two are our technical experts for all the virtual visits here. And then there will be one person, Eric, just stay a little bit. So here we have Eric, one of our Karlsruhe experts on everything you would like to know about hardware downstairs. Well, most of it, I guess. And uh, he will go down with Noemi and film live what you can see below and um, and give a, um, and comment on all the things, interesting things that we can visit now. And I'm happy actually that we managed to have these virtual visits in this situation. And one of the guys responsible for organizing all the visits is sitting here in the background, which is Jacob. Uh, <laughs> oh, um, if Noemi and Eric are okay, then our visit will start here on the surface. So where I'm sitting here, this is LHC.5. Below us, around 100 meters below, is our CMS detector, which is registering events coming from proton-proton or proton-ion collisions or something when the LHC is on. The next beams are foreseen for autumn. September, but the next really physics taking will take place only next year. So what you can see on the screen is you see the surface here. The main, main situation of CERN, where, where the label CERN is, is a Mira site, but there are more points all around. This way. Yeah, this is better. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so something about the nice landscape. So what you can see here is the Lake of Geneva something which is just behind LHCB, so a gray asphalt-like thing that is the airport of Geneva. Then the first mountain just behind is the Salef, and then the Alps in the oh. background, including the Mont Blanc. Yeah. So this really nice, nice view. And in the back, we have the Jura Mountains. And then you can see here um, Geneva at the end of the lake, and on between the lake and the Jura is the LHC accelerator underground. Uh, almost flat. And because we have a terrain going down from the Jura to the lake, the deepest point is around Alice. So that's about 160 meters of depth. Uh, and CMS, we are here on the left hand side. CMS is uh, about 100 meter deep underground. And uh, what Eric and Noemi will show us, they will go down for us. Where are they? They are not connected ah, yet. Okay. Um, so they are already on their way to show us uh, what we can see here in terms physics wise. So let's go to the next slide while yeah. they are on their way. So this is the accelerator complex. I was talking about the LHC. You have seen a lot of this already in our lectures and, uh, and also in the lectures of Frank. And of course, the LHC, Large Hadron Collider, is not something where you put in your particles or your protons right in the beginning. All the protons that go into the LHC, they come in the end out of a hydrogen bottle where the hydrogen molecules H2 are separated. They are stripped off the electrons. They go into a linear accelerator, which is uh, formerly here, LINAC2. And then they go like with a car that has a couple of speeds in several, uh, in, in a cascade of things. They're accelerated first in a ring, which is called booster, then the proton synchrotron, then they go via beam line to the uh, super proton synchrotron, and then via some transfer lines, they go into the LHC. So only in the last step 
the LHC comes into play. Uh, in the beginning, the particles, when they are elevated, actually gain in speed. So from something like zero up to 30%, 90% of speed of light. Uh, in the last acceleration, going, for example, from SPS to the LHC, they do not gain really any more in speed, but in energy. So in the end, we are at 99 point, and then there come five nines uh, percent of the speed of light. And if you put it in numbers, it's 400 meters per second less than the 300,000 kilometers per second, which is the speed of light. So that's the the end of the acceleration here in the LHC. We could go to the next. Yeah. So here we can actually see how this is located underground. So here are the surface points, CERN Merin with Atlas on the other side. So this counted point one. Alice closer to the Jura point, which is dedicated to heavy iron physics, point two. Then we have point five CMS in competition with Atlas as a general purpose detector. And then we have LHCB at point eight, which is looking more into B physics. No, just, just say a second. Uh, and these are the four points we have experiments, but there are more points in total eight. And at some points, there's, for example, beam dump is point six, which is not on this map. But at some point, if you want to stop all the beams immediately, then this goes into beam dump. This was the former Opel experiment when there was still the uh, large electron positron collider. And at one point here on this side, point seven, well, I think it was point 0.7, there's the acceleration. So all no, the acceleration, point 0.4, point four, point four, sorry. So in point 0.4, all the acceleration takes place where you have resonators uh, in cavities, which accelerate the beam each time it passes by. Oh, they are not connected. They are not yet connected. They are not yet connected. So we continue a little bit. Here you see the four detectors, so the large one, Atlas, which is the biggest particle detector, and CMS on the top right, the two general purpose detectors. CMS, if you see the scale here, Zoltan is showing the scale of a person as in compared to our CMS detector. And then on the bottom, LS and LHCB. In the middle, you can see a scheme which is showing the dipole magnet. The dipole magnets are there to put all the protons across the trajectory, which is curved, of course, because of the LHC accelerator. Um, and most of these dipoles have two tubes separated for protons going in one and the other direction. There's a special dipole in front and on the other side of each experimental cavern, where the two, where the two beam tubes are merged into one, because in the end, we would like to collide both beams head on inside the middle of the CMS detector. So, Okay, so m maybe I can ch chime in here real quick. I hope you can hear us okay. Yeah, yeah so now, now we luckily have Eric. Eric, we can hear you. And okay. Okay. Um, stop sharing. Indeed, I'm and you could to... switch to Eric, I would yes, suggest. Yes, exactly. Okay, so just to, to show you this, uh, when Noemi and myself, we just went down and what you're now seeing is the vista up the uh, elevator shaft, the main elevator shaft of CMS. So we are now in about 80, 85 meters underground. And this is where we, we just went down with the, with the elevator. The elevator shaft is pressurized so that, um, because the elevator is actually also the main escape route, route from underground. So whenever there is a fire, you're not supposed to, to walk up 100 meters by the stairs because you might just collapse under uh, halfway. And uh, that's why the elevator shaft is, is our escape route. But that means it has to be under overpressure. Otherwise, you have what you always have in, in high buildings that you're not supposed to use the elevator because it's a perfect chimney. And we are now in the, the first uh, underground level of the, the CMS service cavern. So this is the, the cavern where we're not having the, the detector, but instead all of the electronics, all of the, the cooling systems, which do not need to be in uh, the immediate proximity of the, the detector itself. We also have, uh, this is the area that we're just entering, all of the uh, cooling and uh, power supply for the, the CMS magnet, which obviously is superconducting and thus needs to be cooled down to about four degrees above absolute zero. 
and this is the, the so-called cold box, which is responsible for, um, for that. And all of these things are located in, in this so-called service cabin. And in just a while, we will go further into the, uh, in the experimental cabin where the actual detector is located. The first order, the, the, the paradigm is that anything that doesn't need to be close to the detector, for example, power supplies sometimes need to be close because otherwise the uh, losses inside the cables would be, be too high. Not anything that doesn't need to be in the immediate proximity of the, in the detector, uh, you know, you put into the, the, the service cabin and only the, the things that need to be closed are actually put next to the, the detector. So we'll probably move on, but I would give the microphone back to you, and Klaus, for the moment. Okay. Uh, just as I'm just trying to answer some of the questions. So we have two questions. Uh, one is, are all accelerators underground? Günther has answered already. And yes, all these accelerators are underground. Only some are in the basement of a building. For example, the uh, the um, the Leir accelerator. This is something which you can actually see if you if you have the possibility to come to CERN to visit it. There's an, a little accelerator which you can actually see in the inside the building, and it is surrounded by uh, cement blocks which block any radiation which might uh, go outside. But the large ones are all underground to protect, of course, uh, the environment and, and people and so on. Then there's a question about um, institutions, universities on LS on LHCB. I can't tell you which institutions is exactly are in there, but for example, in, uh, in Alice, there's a GSI at Darmstadt, for example, and Frankfurt. But uh, as an example, for the large collaborations, Atlas CMS, there are around 3,000 collaborators from about 150 institutes all over the world. Uh, and they may, might come from 60 to 70 countries even. And both large collaborations have some colleagues on all continents. So including Australia, New Zealand, and Africa, Asia, uh, everything. If you have more questions, don't hesitate. I see one, wait a second. What is the strength of the magnets? So the big magnet of uh, CMS is 3.8 Tesla. And, yeah, and uh, just to say, Klaus, we, we are right in front of the, uh, take, take let's say the, 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 the supply of the, of the power of this magnet. So you see a very nondescript uh, in, um, uh, electrical cabinet in the background. You have a voltmeter and an amp meter there. And the amp meter is in kilo and in kilo amps. And its scale goes all the way up to 25 because of nominal, nominal field of 3.8 Tesla, as Klaus mentioned. We're going all the way to 18,000 amps, which uh, is still indicated in this um, yeah, rather nondescript uh, cabinet by the needle going to 18,000 uh, amp ampere. So that's where the, the main power is supplied. But then um, please go into to the details. And uh, the large dipole magnets, for example, of the LHC are around 10 Tesla. But the volume is very small. The volume is much smaller. So the, the important piece for CMS is it's a large volume because the calorimeter and the tracker are inside of our superconducting coil. With Atlas, it's only the tracker that is inside. That is one of the construction of the uh, de um, differences between Atlas and CMS. And the accelerator, so these largest dipoles are the ones with 10 Tesla, but that is only surrounding then the beam pipe. So I don't see any other open question for the moment. So Eric, you are in the electronics cabinets. Yeah, if I manage to switch on the microphone. Yeah, indeed, we are now moving further through the, the CMS service cabin. And uh, this is a corridor which, which I'm at home in, so that, that's why I like to show it. But uh, in this corridor, this is one of the, the several corridors that we have down here where all of the readout electronics of the, the detectors is placed. In this case, for the silicon strip tracker of the, the CMS experiment. So the one at the, at pretty much at the heart of the, the, the experiment inside the coil. What you see here are all electronics crawling crates in the, the, the VME standard, which is actually already a fairly old standard. None of the, the things that you see here, here are extremely new. They are typically very robust, but these boards I think are, are more than 15 years old by Eric, now. Eric, one of the yeah. questions is, what are all those lab power supplies or what you were what are all those can you say again what are all those lab 
laboratory power supply. So I don't know how to interpret it exactly, but I, I think they want to have some details about the power supply. Uh, on, this, well. on, 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 what I'm on what I'm showing here. Yeah, yeah what I'm showing you here is uh, in our actually readout boards. So what you see here is in, in each of these slices is one electronics board which reads out a, a section of the, uh, the, the strip checker and all of the, the, the quote unquote cables that you see coming out here, those are not actually cables, those are optical fibers. And these optical fibers are about uh, 60 to 100 meters in length because they go from, from uh, this place here all the way to the inside of the, uh, of the detector and uh, via some patch panels really directly to the individual detector modules. So this is what you're seeing here and you see we have uh, several of these on top and also on the on the other side. And so each part of the detector is read out by optical fibers. You cannot really do this with copper. This is not like your ADSL at home. You want uh, optical fibers because of speed and also because of mass, especially because you don't want to put a lot of, lot of copper in the way of your, your Eric? particles. Yes. Eric, so there's a, a follow-up question. In the beginning of the aisle was a rack of lab power supplies. What are they ah, for? The, Ah, the, the, and these ones, I assume I guess, it's these ones. I guess so. so. The, this uh, is, uh, le, let's say, yes, uh, auxiliary electronics because one of the things that is, uh, is pretty nasty about the LHC is the fact that we have a lot of particle collisions, which is good because we're looking for rare processes. But uh, the, the drawback of that is that in our detectors are exposed to, to an extremely harsh radiation field. The first thing that that entails is that we have to cool them in order so that the, the radiation damage does not destroy them very readily. So the, uh, the, the inner detectors are running at a temperature of uh, minus 20 degrees, so a bit warmer whenever the detector is switched on. But that means that one, one of the things that you need is that this is about as, as cool as in your freezer. Now, the thing that you see in your freezer very often is that you have ice formation. Now, that's something that we obviously cannot afford, so that's something we have to rigorously avoid. By, by injecting dry air, but also we have to make sure that on the outside of the, the volume of the detector volume itself, which is well sealed obviously because we, we don't want any, any humid air to, to penetrate into it, but still we have to make sure that also on the outside we're not condensing because there are other detector systems of CMS in the way. And these power supplies, they're exactly for the, the heating elements which are on the outside of the, the cold volume so as to maintain thermal neutrality towards the outside. We always have to be about the dew point. Otherwise, you're condensing like in your bathroom or, or elsewhere. And that's something that we do not want because water and electronics goes in, uh, never goes together well. Eric, while you are there, so there's a question what this detector safety system is. You were showing the label of this. I was showing the sector safety. Ah, OK, so the right next to, to it and in several of the of these these things, I can actually go to, to another corridor because there we have even, even more uh, of this. The, the detector has, a, has an extremely extensive uh, safety system. So all of, all of these things that say the same type of equipment we have here in one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight racks, all of them are equipped with these things. And uh, this is an, all based on PLCs, programmable logic controllers. These are hardware safety systems. And these things are fairly generic. They, they can, can basically monitor and control any number of things. So you might be looking at at currents that get sent to your detector. You might be looking at uh, voltage settings. You might be looking at temperatures. You can be looking at dew points and uh, humidities. And uh, these things are, are extremely reliable. They are redundant, set up redundant also. So they're, they're pretty much fail safe. They also have their own power supplies. You see the orange stripes here. So they, they will not easily lose power. And they will make sure that the detector is always put into a safe state. Now a safe state, can can mean very different things. So there's also a certain logic because if your detector is very cold, then if you have a problem, the, you don't want to blindly cut all power, for example, because that m might mean that all of a sudden you are you are condensing everywhere. So you might, in addition, need to to change the the temperature of your cooling system, ramp it up to to warm temperatures. You might have to switch on additional heating elements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, this is indeed, especially for the, the detectors which are running at these, these uh, very much sub-zero temperatures, is a very central in, in piece. One, that if it works perfectly, you don't notice at all and you near, never hear anything about it. But it is the key piece that is, uh, is, in, in, is there to, to keep the detector safe at all times. Even if the light goes out completely, if there is a complete power cut in a thunderstorm or something like this, these things stay on 
and they monitor the state of the, the, the detector and make sure that it either is in a safe state or if there's any deviation that they put it into a safe state automatically. That's, that's why there are the orange stripes, right? To, to demonstrate that these racks might have electricity even this, if there's a general power cut. Yeah, this is us being nice to, to the yeah. firefighters because obviously if you're trying to extinguish a fire, it's nice to know that there's still current in the rack. So maybe you could show us the cables underneath where they go to the cavern. Yeah, that I can do. So I have another question, which is how high is the voltage you measure in the experiment? So that's a little difficult question because we are essentially not really interested in measuring voltages. We're interested in, in measuring currents. So for example, you have a high tension between a central cable and the outside and it's gas filled. You have a charged particle passing through. It creates a track of charged ionized gas, and then you have a current that is flowing. So we Actually, would like to measure the, charge, the current of it. At least the charge. Yeah, you know, okay. The, how, how much charge is how deposited? How much charge is deposited? That is something that you like to measure. So it's not an experiment where we are measuring high voltage, not as experiment, where we are putting high voltage in place in order to give the voltage to operate our detectors. And also in silicon detectors, usually it's the current that we measure where some pixel is it, for example. But in order to measure the charge, you need high voltage, at least for the gas field chambers. And these are the red cables you see on the picture. Uh, we use uh, several kilovolts. It depends on the detector design. Uh, in DT, I think it is 3.6, if I'm not completely wrong. And this is very similar in the gems as well. Yeah. Uh, so we need several kilovolts in order to make the, the the field amplification in the gas field chambers. Yeah. Okay. So Eric, where are the cables? He showed the cables already. So yeah, he but he didn't say anything. The gas he didn't say okay. anything. He was you were too fast. We were still answering. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, but uh, so now we're basically half a floor down. So this is the the stairs we just came down. So this is where we're, we're coming and. This is basically the false floor underneath the, the cavern. So everything that looks very tidy on top still looks reasonably tidy underneath. But this is really where, where all of the, the cables are going. And uh, if we move on along here, I'm kind of banging my head onto the beams, which is why I need to wear a helmet. And yeah, yeah. Uh, then like this. This is where then the cables are all going down. So let me see if I can show you. This is where then you, you have a drop of about 10 meters or so, five to 10 meters, where all of these cables are going down. And then they are crossing over into the uh, experimental cavern to the detector itself. Yeah. So, so we can in, also in, see it on this side. So in fact, we have two large caverns underground, one with the experiment inside, which is called USX. And then we have a second cavern where all the electronics equipment and read out and power power supplies, etc. cetera, are located. That is where, um, just where Eric you. actually is. And, uh, and these two caverns are, of course, connected by some uh, tunnels. And Eric is going to pass by one of them. So Eric is somewhere here. Yeah, so Eric is here. This is the service cavern. And the experiment is here, which is the experimental cavern. And then you can see tunnels coming from the right and from the left, which is the LHC tunnel. And then you have here connections where people can go into the tunnel from uh, our service cavern, for example. And uh, Eric should just now go to a place where you can go into the service cavern over here. So well, Eric, the one thing I, I still wanted to, to, to show, I hope people can, can see this, is uh, all of the other things that you need. So one of the things that we, we already saw was how you read out the detectors. We will also see how you power the, de the detectors. We saw safety system, and this is another big part of what several of the detectors need, which is the, what we call the, ga the gas room. And uh, this is where, where gas supply for, for the detectors is. This can be anything from just dry, dry gas, which is used for the inner detectors exactly to avoid condensation. But for the muon systems, uh, it can also be, be a special gas mixture, which is used for the, for the detection of the particles. So that exactly you apply a high voltage to, to this gas mixture and whenever a charged particle passes through, you, you can actually detect this and you have the amplification in the, in the gas. So again, one of these things, which is pretty much out of the, the, the public eye very often, and, uh, but not nonetheless something which is very important. Noemi is still 
showing us something else. So, so actually you're seeing something that is not part of a standard uh, CERN CMS visit. So this is not allowed for the public and you can see something here ah, in, in, in life, yeah, but, but usually cannot be visited. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Noemi, this is Aachen and not Karlsruhe. Yeah, yeah, yeah we just said <laughs> that indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the university. The, okay, the, but, the but the principle, we are monitor. exactly also at the at the point where, where, as you said, we wouldn't will be crossing over into the experimental mm -hmm. cavern UC, uh, UXC. And uh, here, by the way, the, this is one of the points where you could be entering the realm of the accelerator, so the the LHC. This is a door which is uh, which is secured. We we're not allowed to go through in, through here. The only thing that you do see is that uh, this is an emergency exit. So if there really is a big problem, and for example, our other excellent gate path over here would be blocked then uh, in an emergency situation we could be going here why is this important because i said our our elevator is the is the escape path and that's the one we should be using and if we go through here we would actually have the possibility to access a second elevator which normally is only used by people working on the the lhc machine uh, but uh, which in emergency situation we can be using and then i would maybe show the um, the the lock so to speak that we have to go through because this is not just a standard door but it is a quite secure system. Anybody who has seen Angels and Demons knows how this, uh, how this works. So uh, you need to, to uh, get somebody's eyeball in order to, to get through. So first we have to badge in order to prove that in principle, this person has requested the access, but then it will scan my iris. And only if the two informations match and I have all of the, the authorizations, then it will that open the inner door. And I think I that through. is a slight difference with respect to to the angels and demons. Uh, you probably remember the, the plot. Uh, they cut out the eye of the, yeah. the professor. Wouldn't These new devices, we, we used that moda for, for very long, for, for many years, but this is the, the newer version. This scans both irises and also checks for the blood circulation. So yeah, 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 that's also that, that's also what I always tell the, in the groups in, in order so that nobody kills me just to, to get access because it won't even help them. And they would have killed me for nothing, so that's why. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they would, they would need to take you hostage. Exactly, but... exactly. And but but even then, it's not so easy because the system is quite paranoid about letting people, uh, letting two people ex enter at the same time. Yeah, they they okay. would count. They would count your legs, and if they count to four, you can't pass either. They count the legs. Yeah. They count the torso, and the they count the neck. Yeah. So good. So maybe but... I can I can now take over because we're now crossing over into the experimental hall, so and so Eric... we're now we. Yes. When, when you're when you're there, so there's a question on the color code of the cables. Do you yeah. want to okay. answer or does Zoltan? No, I didn't want to answer until he yeah, arrives we, there. That but is why okay. I'm asking because yeah. <laughs> here we can see the colors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, exactly. Okay, but I, let me, let me maybe. Answer. Yeah, let me, but let me maybe maybe face first say, say a few words here because now now we have really entered, let's say the the, the interesting part of our our tour. So this what you see here is really the the, the CMS experiment. As you might know, it's 15 meters in, in height, and we are at about uh, half of that. So what you see there, the, the green structure, from the middle of this green structure, that's where normally the, the beam pipe, so the, the vacuum vessel for the, um, for the beams, would be coming out. At this very moment in time, this is, uh, this is taken out, so you see nothing. But under normal circumstances, this is where the, where the particles would be coming out, and then they're passing through the center of the, the detector. All of the orange structure that you see here is uh, at the moment semi-open. This is actually just shielding. This has no, let's say, active role. The only thing is when, whenever the, the accelerator is working, then uh, in, uh, and uh, th there's a lot of background particles that are coming from the, the tunnels because you have protons colliding with, with residual air atoms inside the beam pipe. And this was always shower the, the, the CMS experiment with particles, and this we want to avoid. And this is why we have these very huge things which are on which are on hinges and which can really open and close in order to protect the experiment and then well we can just move on no, normally i should say everything here on the balcony because we can't move further and forward but we can here then zoltan maybe you can say something for the color code because i know I only know from part of the color code oh yeah i i know also the, the the part probably the other part i know the blue i know the red uh the red is always high voltage in in the experiment the blue is associated with the muon systems, uh, low voltage, uh, and of course not data cable because we, we get the optical fibers from there. Uh, I think the green is the, the tracker, if I'm not completely wrong, but, but you know it better than I do, Eric. 
and also there is white for the uh, for the calorimetry. So we, by looking at the cables, we we can tell which subsystem they belong to. But of course, we take uh, take the tracing of all the cables. We have the three D model of the cable uh, tracks, and also every single cable is marked. So we know what we cut. Yeah, yeah the, the 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 tracker, and the point is also. Everything that looks like cables, not everything that, that looks like your standard household cable is a cable. For example, for the for the tracker, we have a dark green, which would be indeed power cables. But then we also have uh, we have light green, and light green is actually again optical fibers, so to to read out and control the, the the detector. So we have the question whether you are connected via Wi-Fi in the cavern or so. Uh, and in yeah. fact, no, the connection is via mobile phone because Wi-Fi passes very, very badly inside tunnels. Well, indeed, we, we so both we have, have Wi-Fi. We have some Wi-Fi, but it's not a continuous connection. The continuous connection is made by an extra mobile phone system that we have underground. And one of the reasons why we have uh, sometimes an interruption is on the surface, we are on the French side and we have... Uh, uh, we have um, a French phone service, but underground, it's allowed to have our main provider, which is Swisscom. So when going from the surface to the underground, there's a switch over from the French network to the Swiss one. And this is working worse than when going up again. So exactly, when, when exactly. on the way Swiss down, the we, we used to lose the, yeah. the, the mobile team, but on the way up, they usually stay connected. But uh, the, the phone is very, uh, very intelligent. So at this moment, I can't tell whether they are using Wi-Fi or, or yeah. 4G. Um, we fortunately the software changes over seamlessly. But as far as I see, the question was also regarding what is the influence of the Wi-Fi to the data taking. Uh, yes, we turn off the Wi-Fi during the during data, data taking. taking. Anyway, there is another solution. The Wi-Fi is not used. Nobody is in the cavern when when we are taking data. So all these uh, perturbation sources are turned off. Great. But of course, also we are very well shielded. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why also the long cables are, are optical ones, that they are not susceptible for any yeah, electromagnetic so. interference. Okay, so maybe maybe just to, to say where I am here, uh, as you can see, I am now really on top of the, the CMS experiment. So this is about as high as you as you can get here. Above me, there is only the, the crane and then the, the ventilation. And looking on the other side, you saw this already in a side view. This is where the, the detector is. The detector is at the moment in a semi-open configuration. And now we are looking on top, from the top onto what we call the, the, the end cap nose. So this is a part that, uh, as you might have seen from the, from the side, in normal operation when the detector is fully closed, really go protrudes into the inside of the, the, what we call the vac tank, so the vacuum insulation vessel of the, the CMS magnet. This is where the, the end cap calorimetry is placed and uh, also the first station of the, the muon system at the, the very back of it. And uh, yeah, this is a, yeah, a vista so. that is normally not afforded to any visit. Yeah. And maybe just while I'm here and while I have the mic, if I now change the, the view really to the top, you see this, uh, this access shaft will maybe also go completely underneath it. But uh, this is the, um, uh, the big opening to which the, uh, the, all of the large pieces of the, the detector were lowered down into the cavern one by one. And uh, this went anywhere. The, the lightest piece uh, was about 300 tons and the central piece with, um, with the magnet inside weighed about 2000 tons in the configuration that it was uh, lowered down. So that was obviously not done with was on one of these standard yellow cranes that we see here. They only uh, can lift a puny 20 tons. Uh, for that, we had a, had a special crane that was installed exactly for that purpose on the surface. So Eric, what do you do when you have to move them in the cavern, the big parts? Uh, that's a fair question to which I would maybe come back when, we, when we're on the ground level of the, the experiment, then I can, can show this a bit better. All right. So we got a question about, uh, I have heard that there are microphones installed to be able to detect malfunctions. They are not yet there. We are thinking of having some microphones, some uh, well artificial intelligence or deep learning things to to detect malfunctions. We have cameras indeed, and the camera pictures are brought up to the shifter 
here to see the, the, the things. And also the detector, as probably you heard about the, the detector safety system, the detector is also uh, 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 always monitored by, uh, by, by sensors and, and uh, in case of more functions, uh, the, the so-called action metrics will do its job to yeah. turn off parts of the detector or the whole one. The, the most prominent noise that you hear when you're inside the cavern or around is climatization, so cooling. So that's the most prominent noise. So if you would like to identify some small malfunctions that are not connected to alarms, then you really have to do something in order to extract this from the background. And I think that is the reason why Zoltan mm -hmm. mentioned microphones and uh, some no, it is networks not there. to extract it. Is it. Not but, there, yeah. but we have not installed it yet. Then uh, what are the day-to-day -day tasks inside the cavern right now? Just one more comment. Yeah. So about the noise, the cooling noise, the, the turbine noises that you might hear uh, when Eric is talking. Uh, these things are so much imprinted in our brain <laughs> that if they are not there, if the detector cavern is silent, for example, I don't feel good at all. <laughs> so if, if during Christmas time, when we turn off the cooling, I go down, for a safety tour, I, I always have something in the back of my mind that, come on, something is going wrong. <laughs> so uh, maybe if I can, I can take over. So we, now yeah. we, are, we are standing prominently next to one of these end cap noses. And here you can see that the, uh, that the CMS magnet, which is this, the round structure of the CMS in the middle, it is now partially exposed. One of the, the detector elements is slightly open. So let me move to the, to the side of the, the detector. So what you see here is really the outside of the, the magnet. Well, not quite because there, there are plates around it and that again, uh, supposed to, to provide a thermal shield so that the, that the detectors just adjacent to, to that are not influenced by the power cables that run on top of the, the magnet. You might be seeing this because uh, obviously all of the detectors that are on the inside of the magnet, they have to be supplied with, uh, with power and they have to be read out. Now magnets don't like if you just drill holes into them so all of the cables for the inner detectors have to be really routed on top of the magnet, all the way around it, and then to the to the inside. And uh, the, this is obviously it dissipates quite a bit of power, and the, the detectors right next to it have to be shielded. And here you see this what I call this nose structure, which uh, fits exactly into the to the inside of this uh, this vacuum tank into the inside of the the magnet. So while then it seems that there is a, quite a bit of open space, there is actually only a, a few centimeters of space when this is, uh, is fully closed. And the other thing, as we said, is the, the strength of the magnet. You, you can always uh, I don't know, verbalize this in terms of current, in terms of volume, et cetera. But this is a, a structure, this nose, and, and the, the element it is connected to is a, is a structure that weighs 1,300 tons and rests against very, very solid uh, stopping elements. Nonetheless, when the magnet switches on, this nose structure gets, and gets drawn by in by about a centimeter in uh, and a half into the magnet by the sheer force of the of the magnet. So all of this is even also constructed in such a way that it will that it will move by this amount gently because otherwise the magnet typically wins whenever you you go up against it. So uh, you you would just break this if it wouldn't it wouldn't allow for these type of movements. So do do you know what the day to day task for today is? For example, Oof. so what's the work package? I so think the... they open the this wheel that you see. And uh, actually, in general, what we can say that once when, when we do not measure with the detector during these long shutdowns, as we call, you know that we stopped the measurement somewhere around two years ago. Um, we this is a good time to maintain the equipment. We have several sub detectors. In total, we have some 120 million channels. So you might imagine that we might have lots of work. Since this is an experiment, we have new detectors to be installed, uh, some of them to be, re to be removed as well. The new detectors, the, the jam chambers Checker, that are uh, not and, inside. Right? Uh, and and, and the, the pixel is removed, the pixel is going to come back soon. So, so there are lots of work. These works uh, have to be coordinated. Otherwise, it would be a mess, not just because of we, we all wouldn't fit 
uh, in the detector Maybe. cavern at the same time, but as well as the, the resources are limited. Uh, so it should be coordinated and we have a day to day, uh, day by day schedule. I think on the, the ground floor, you might show it. We have a screen or in the, the elevator that shows the the latest day by day for today and yeah but maybe if i if i can just uh, chime in in, uh, in in very practical terms we have this this detector element here which is uh, which is somewhat moved away and i can show in a second that the other three elements and uh, of the of the detector they are really pushed back against the wall so any access in between these elements is simply not possible right now we do we created a gap at the in in this position and so that means some detectors which are on this side, for example, they, they, this is the only time that they are really easily accessible because otherwise you have another element of the, the detector that just sits flush against it. And there is absolutely no, no way to, to access these things. So you have to create these type of gaps in order to, to work on these detector elements. And as you can see from the amount of space that you, that you have, as I said, here back at the wall, we have three big elements of the, of the detector and uh, there is not a ton of them um, of space so you have to to coordinate because other, otherwise there is simply no way that you create enough space for people to work on all of the detector elements yeah, at the exactly. same time yes. we could have made it uh, our detector cavern is 55 meters long in order to be able to open all parts of the detector i think 70 meters would be enough but the problem is that the most expensive part of the detector is the detector cavern Either yeah. you believe or not. Yeah, you have to, <laughs> you have to dig all this. Exactly. And the civil so, so, engineering is the, the yeah. most expensive. So, so part, part of the day-to-day -day work is, of course, moving very carefully all these wheels of the detector apart and together again without hitting any edges or something, without destroying any cables and, and whatnot. And I think Eric is now here where he can show us how we are moving actually these detectors, yeah, right? Exactly. This is even it's even properly labeled. I think this still comes from the the open days of a certain. And uh, what you see here is uh, the 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 red structure is uh, somehow the the, the detector yeah. element itself. This is just the support. But the orange part, these these feet, these are actually big hydra hydraulic pads. So. This is an air cushion that we that we can power up, and you see the same thing actually on the other side, where you have this set of of air cushions. Now I'm standing right in front of this this detector element that I just showed you, the one that was just moved away in order to create create a gap. And it's really as simple as that. You just take compressed air and you power up these cushion cushions, these air cushions, and then there's literally a gap between the cavern floor and these detector elements. And then you can slide them. Now you obviously don't want to slide them by hand. What you also see lying here are big uh, steel cables. And at the end of the, the cavern, we have a winch system and we have a, an, an equivalent one on the other side of the, the cavern. And this winch system is what you can then use in order to, to drag these elements where you want them. Now there is one subtlety in all of that that is always something that the, the specialists for this movement are always insisting on. And that's for geological region, re reasons. The, uh, the, the LHC tunnel is not, uh, is not exactly uh, horizontal. It has a very slight inclination. It goes a bit higher towards the Jura. It goes a bit down towards the, the Lake Geneva. And the cavern effectively f follows this uh, slope. And that means one part of the cavern is higher than the, than the other one. And so what we have, even if it's very slight, it's not something that you, that you really feel in your all day life but you actually have movements which go uphill and movements yeah, which, are, which are going downhill. So in one case, you have to drag the elements and in the other case, you, you might have to make sure that, that they're not just uh, going somewhere where you don't, don't want them. If you would put them all on, uh, on, on air cushions at the same time, they would all slowly collect on, on one end of the, of the cavern. So these are the small subtleties, even if you, in, that you need to pay attention to, even if you're moving elements of, uh, of more than a thousand tons. Okay, so maybe it's some more questions. So how often do you have to fix something? So uh, with millions of parts, why we are taking data continuously, I would say, uh, but we managed to have all systems working for more than 95 or 97% most of the time. So that is really the aim and that was really achieved. So having to fix something that happens quite frequently and that is one of the reasons why we have also access to the uh, to the electronics cavern while the experimental cavern is not accessible. And most and of the time we manage to avoid 
having something broken, which is difficult to access. When this happens, we can only do this during uh, either a small or a long shutdown where we can move the detector apart. Yeah, we so can... that, that happens luckily rarely. Exactly, we can open the detector. So opening the detector in, in a status it's like always, this, yeah. it takes almost a month. So uh, obviously we can do this only during the long shutdowns and the year end shutdowns when we, when we have a couple of months without beam. Uh, we have uh, small uh, uh, shutdown periods in every six weeks when we are, we are taking data. That's mainly for the accelerator, but these are three days when we can do something on the detector. And of course, if there is any, any major issue, uh, we can come in when the, the beam is dumped. Yeah. So uh, we can either ask for a beam dump, we never did it in the past, or we can come in between uh, the beam dump and the refill. Of course, this must be uh, uh, discussed and agreed with the with the beam controls. Yeah. Eric, you have another nice picture. We answer the next questions when you when you finished and move on. Ah, well, this is this is just us uh, sl somehow slowly going from one side to the other. So this is again very, now very prominently this uh, detector nose. And I mean, here you can kind of see the, the the dimensions a bit maybe. The Siemens magnet has an inner diameter of six meters. And so this is obviously also the size of uh, the, this detector element. And so all of this has to, has to fit into the inside of the, the solenoid. And there really is not a lot of, a lot of uh, space, as I said, there are a few centimeters. This is the vista on the, on the other side. So this is a quite, uh, quite nice picture. This is Eric, also, yes. Eric, if you could keep this picture, yeah. We could answer one of the questions. How is the beam pipe moved when moving the detector closer to the wall? We always move along the beam pipe. So if the beam pipe, even if it is installed, at this moment it is missing from the picture, if the, the beam pipe is, uh, is installed, we can always slide the detector along like you can slide your purse on your necklace. And this has to be done extremely carefully because the material is beryllium, which is uh, quite poisonous. So you never would like to, oh, to, quite to break only a in the pipe. Only in the very central part. Yeah, only the very central part. Uh, uh, but this is also very, very expensive and only one firm can produce it somewhere in California. So we, we don't have infinite amount of that. And then there's a question on the vacuum system. So, is the vacuum system inside of the detector cavern or somewhere else? So there are vacuum systems all around the accelerator because all the beam pipes, of course, have to be evacuated. They are 10 to the minus 13th, I believe, atmospheres of, uh, of pressure inside the beam pipe. And that means you have to ev evacuate all along the beam line, not just in the cavern or not just in the tunnel, everywhere. Yeah, I then, actually wanted to cross over because, because we, we actually, Okay, if we go back to, to where we just were, uh, then we can actually see this green structure that we were looking at just a second ago that these people are working on. Pretty much just inside of this, uh, this green structure, this is exactly where the, the last active element of the, of the machine is. Just a bit further out, you have the last steering magnet. Where, so any possibility for the machine to influence the, 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 the position of the beams also at the collision point inside the experiment. So you have to steer them over, over 15 to 20 meters. But also the, the last part of the vacuum system is not inside the detector itself. It is really inside this, this green structure. So that's a 15 to 20 meters away from the, the interaction point. But then you have, you have this on, on the one side and equivalently on the other side of the, the cabin. Yep. Next. The LHC for uh, the detector stays radioactive after the shutdown, after, I mean, turning off the, the, the beam, turning I guess. Off beams. Uh, obviously, during the beam, we have irradiation of the, the various elements that might, uh, where, where uh, radionuclides might, might be created. The lifetime of these radionuclides might vary, might vary. Uh, most of them decay in the, the very first minute or the very first second, but some of them stay, namely the cobalt 60. Uh, in the iron, the manganese 45 in the iron as well, and they all have several years of half-life. In order to minimize the 
the this kind of remanent uh, radioactivity. For example, we all our steel we order with the, the with the less cobalt content. So this is something that we already designed for at the at the design phase. If I, but of if course, I recall, there's also no silver. No silver. In, no silver because that would stay radioactive too. Exactly. And also the aluminium might turn into sodium if I'm not completely wrong. Uh, so all of the equipment, all of the material that we plan to, to install in the detector is also regarded from this viewpoint. Yeah. Uh, but the answer is that the radioactivity, for example, now is very low in the detector. There are some parts that might stay activated uh, a little higher, but most of the detector, for example, what you see now is uh, practically non-radioactive. What you saw the green structure or within the green structure that stays a bit uh, radioactive. So the closer to the beam pipe you are, the higher the risk of something that stays radioactive. Exactly. But then all materials, which is risky, we try to avoid as much as possible. Exactly. And on the other hand, we try to, for example, those works that you saw on the green structure before are, are uh, uh, planned from concern of radioactivity as well, from those as well. So before we would start those works, we 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 uh, uh, check the the radioactive dose that will be absorbed. We let by it people, cool down, and we let it cool down. That's why we do it now and not uh, not, not after the, the shutdown, but uh, after a long part of the shutdown. Exactly, and also the people are there are equipped with not just the normal dosimeter that you saw at the at the entrance gate, but also some Eric? active dosimeters. Yeah, exactly. I I give back the word to Eric. Yeah, this, so this is this is the uh, what I mentioned earlier. This is the choreography day by day. So as you see, this somehow gives a gives a top view of how the the experiment is configured, where there is a gap. So you 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 really see that there is the the nose and the three elements are on the the very left side. Then you have a small gap where some part of the the, the magnet is exposed, and then on the on the other side, and you can you can here go to the next day, and you see that there's some activities that might just continue. There might be a change to the detector configuration, but for each and every day, it is always recorded. And now here, you see this is Saturday, and you see you see that there is still some some activity. So it's not that we're working seven days a week, but uh, depending on the on the need, also work on the, on Saturday uh, is uh, is being done. Obviously, but you see that the, the Saturday it, work plan is much less than the other days. That is true, and I mean the, the, the general paradigm is obviously that. That uh, you you must not wear out from people doing too much, and the the number of people that we have is also limited. It's not that you that you can simply say I have one crew for the weekdays and the other one for the, the weekend. It's exceptionally that part of the crew might also be working on the on the weekends in order to do works which maybe need uh, very little co-activity inside the cabin, or we sometimes also use this in order to maybe catch up uh, a bit where we we lost a bit of time and we might be able to to catch up slightly by working on Saturday. But it's not that round the clock seven days a week where there is really activity ongoing. The point is everything that is down here is uh, is very delicate. So you also don't want to work here when you're completely tired. The, these things are not very forgiving. They deserve your, your full and undivided attention anytime you are here. And just to say many... maybe before I give it back the microphone, we would be uh, in the next few minutes be moving out of the, the cabin. So in case there are specific questions that you, you want to ask for, for, for things that we can also show here, then uh, I would invite you to, to do so now. So Eric, so I don't have a question open here, but you were talking a lot about the nose and so on. Could you tell us what we are measuring with the nose and the trapezoidal structures that we have on the end wheel? Yeah, I uh, I, I said it very much in passing by, but uh, the this nose and structure, the very forward part of it, is uh, the, uh, the the forward part of the electromagnetic calorimeter. So really, the the very few first few uh, twenty. 20 to 30 centimeters. After that, we have the hadronic calorimeter. So all of the, these is calorimetry. That means you stop the particles. You try to, to extract all of their, their energy. And uh, only the only thing that really pass through are muons, as you might, might know. And this is exactly what we're looking at for all of these trapezoidal structures. All of these are muon chambers. So these are gas detectors. In this case, that's uh, cathode strip chambers. And they are used to, to measure the momenta of the, the muon. 
And sometimes, by, by the, almost by construction, anything that passes through the, the, the vast return yoke of the, the magnet, and, and those are those are essentially you know, just muons. And here, and you see the, um, these trapezoidal structures, and you see that this is a disk structure. So these things are, are, are vertical. Whereas if we move toward the, the, the other part, you see that uh, all of these detector elements, they are, they are parallel to the beam. And this is what we always can refer to as a, as a barrel and end cap structure. So in the barrel, you have these concentric layers of detection elements. Also here in the, the everything that is silver here is, the, um, is a detection element from one of the big drift tube chambers. And uh, everything that is red is the, the iron return yoke of the, of the magnet. But here we have concentric layers um, with the, the detectors parallel to the beam pipe. Whereas in the, in the end cap, as that these things are vertical. And uh, because here the, the particles coming from the interaction region, they are already coming at a, at a rather steep angle. So in order to best measure them and measure their, their momenta, this is the way you want to arrange your detector elements. OK, then I suggest uh, you come up again. Yeah, all right. And in the meantime, we can answer how many people are working on the detector side. Yeah. Very hard to tell. <laughs> it depends from day to day, but yeah, but I think in, in, in total we are something like uh, 150, 200 people each day, not each day in total. And each day we are down something like 30, 40 people. That is a upper limit of, of people in the cavern at the, at the given time. This is 80. For safety reasons, we cannot be more. I, I recall that at one point we were 200 downstairs and that was for the evacuation test yeah but uh, two, 200 uh, the uxc plus the us yeah that oh. can happen yeah but but that was also for the emergency test which, yeah exactly which, when which we filled works, in the maximum number which worked brilliantly yeah we we often run these these tests at least once per year in order to first of all people keep people sensible or sensitive for the for these kind of procedures and the other is to test the procedures themselves. Uh, just, just safety, is, briefly, safety is a very important part. Spe speaking of safety, just uh, it's, it's almost a detail, but one of the things that you can ask yourself, is there any way to bring stuff into the, the, the cabin? Because not everything fits nicely through these, these tiny doors. If you have a bit bigger equipment, you don't want to always use uh, the, the crane in order to lower things down. And this is exactly why we have these material access doors. And they function very much like a, like a lock like for, for a ship. So you have two doors and uh, you always have to first close one door and there are movement sensors on the, on the inside. And uh, th this prevents that you're, you're simply sneaking your colleague who doesn't really have the access through this thing, but at the same time still allows you to bring material into the the, the cavern that is a bit m more we uh, unwieldy than than fits through, through the door again the, the paradigm is always safety make sure that nobody can can have unauthorized access here and uh, yeah that, that you also cannot easily forget anybody anybody who goes into the cavern is accounted for by the by the access system exactly that's and very important to know how many people and who are these people in case of a rescue operation so in the fiber yeah. just in, in just normal go. operations, you see that Eric is passing by this scheme normally. But of course, there was also a handle which is called emergency handle. And in case of an emergency, you are allowed to keep the door open and that everybody can go out fast without all these checks. But this is only for emergency. But in this case, yeah. even in this case, we have a, a procedure to count people and, and identify them at the access of the of the experimental area. And you can also check whether you bring in or better whether you bring out some radioactive pieces. So he just checked. And um, in well, this in end, principle is one, is one of the th standard things that you have to do whenever you're you're going out of the cabin. You should be checking that you you have not contaminated yourself because in in the end the the risk of uh, of being severely irradiated if you're you're not in very particular spots of the detector is very li limited. But in principle, any kind of dust that has been present when during beam operation could be could be activated. So you could be be picking up um, dust from a from a surface somewhere in principle that uh, is uh, slightly activated. And so we have these hand fund monitors in order to just make sure that uh, that you have not touched any of this of this radioactive dust and taken it with you. So in the end, it's extremely difficult for people to come in unauthorized. 
So it is difficult to get in, but it's easy to get out in case of emergency. For material, it's the other way around. It's quite easy to get in, but to get out, you have to check all kinds of radio radioactive contamination and so on. So for material, it's more difficult to get out. And then is the whole ring baked out to reach the, the desired design, like, vacuum? Yes. yes, everything is baked out. Yeah. Of course, this, uh, this cannot be baked out at, uh, in one go. No. So in different steps, we, for example, what we see in the detector, the, 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 the beam pipe in the detector is baked out uh, at different steps. The uh, central beam pipe is, is baked out first than the than the uh, than the the other two on both sides uh, and probably very probably this is the 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 way how they bake out the rest of the yeah. 27 kilometers but of course you're absolutely right it should be baked out the ion getters should be uh, um, re refreshed with the bake out as well uh, because the, the the vacuum is an ultra high vacuum that we are Required. What I don't understand is the question, how does this work with the enlarging of the structure? So uh, the LHC cannot be enlarged. No, the LHC so, cannot be enlarged, um, as I understood that this is uh, usually the vacuum system is something that fits on the table or fits in, in a room in case of, a, of an accelerator. In our case, this is, a, uh, this is a bigger city. So this is how I understood enlarging. Hmm. But of course, everything should be baked out, that's for sure. Okay, so Eric and Noemi are at the surface again, so they will yeah. show up in... I, I'm, the, the only question is I could briefly pass by the, the SX-5. Just yes, show of the, 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 yes, the of course. Yes, of course. If we have time, Winter. It's going to take the better part of two minutes or so. Yeah, no problem. Okay. And also in this room, you could show some, some detector parts on the way back. So here he is moving on a, through a surface building that connects the control room and the shaft with a, a surface hall. And this surface hall originally served to construct and put together the detector already on the surface. Mm -hmm. So because Atlas is so large, it could only be put together underground. So they had to have their cavern ready to be installed uh, right in time, while CMS could afford to have some delays with the cavern. But uh, for that purpose, we had this surface hall where everything could yeah. be tested yeah. already before bringing the pieces down. So if you remember 20 years ago, I mean, the audience, uh, we, we still had the large electron positron collider. We had a very turmoil time when, when we almost saw or we, hope that we see the Higgs boson, you remember. And so therefore uh, we asked for an extended work time of the, of the lab. But of course we had to start the, the civil engineering works of, the, of the, the, LHC. the LHC. In case of the CMS part, we couldn't start to excavate the cavern because the, the uh, beam pipe was there and the old accelerator was there. In case of the Atlas, they could excavate it uh, part of the, the, the cavern, namely uh, the roof. So they, they put the roof in, anchored to the neighboring uh, stones, and they continued the cavern when, they, uh, when, when the, the lab was removed. In our case, we, since also the detector is very complicated, we had no other choice but to build up the detector on the surface. That's why we have so, this, this giant hole. Yeah. Eric, he is there. Okay, so Eric, I, I think you can continue. Yeah, yeah. So we are on the in the surface on the hall now. So the first thing that we typically show is this. This is the uh, spare detector that we keep up here in case the other one downstairs breaks. No, not really, but this is a, a life-size picture of the, the detector. It gives you a, an impression if you look at the at the size of this hall. This gives you a very very good impression of how it has looked back then, how full this hall was when the, the detector was still here. As Zoltan said, the, the detector was assembled uh, fully in this hall. And actually, even the CMS magnet was uh, switched on while the, the detector was uh, still residing here. And uh, this is the, the whole length of the, of the hall. So now, as I said, you have to envisage that there is a detector the size of CMS in here. Uh, obviously, today, this is not used, uh, used anymore for this purpose. 
but uh, it's still a very active um, building. It's uh, on the one hand, the, the the building. I will show this uh, in, a, in a bit in differently. You can some come and somehow Jesus just before this picture is where the the shaft that goes downstairs that I showed from the other side uh, is located. This is where all of the detector elements were lowered. And uh, so that means this is one of the, the, the paths that we have in order to bring and then bring uh, things into the, the cavern. What you see in the background are, are lab spaces to in today. So the, these are lab spaces where people are working, where, for example, detector elements are extracted from uh, the, the, the cavern and then they're brought up here for maintenance. And uh, then the people can work in these uh, these lab spaces. You'll have access from the from the top, which is obviously good good so that you can really lower the the detector elements in there. The detector elements are, as we mentioned, slightly radioactive, so you don't want to just leave them li lying around somewhere. But uh, you have all of these these uh, lab spaces which are which are controlled, so you cannot just en enter and exit. You have to you have you need to have radio like radio protection. Uh, procedures in place and for, for them, but uh, you don't really need to just walk in, in there, but you can really have, uh, have the, the elements being lowered into this area with a, with a crane. Okay, so you're coming back to the control room. Well, I would, the, the only one, one thing I would show is going up the, the stairs here real quick, because then you can okay. somehow look from the from top into this. Yeah. This access so, shaft. So this building was it built uh, years after the 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 detector building, indeed, uh, because we we needed office spaces. I think this and is a very here. nice view. On the left side, you might see the pit head cover. This is a, a iron concrete, more iron than concrete, a sliding block approximately two meters thick and then uh, this can be slide in uh, if we if we run the detector and slide out into this position if we have to reach with the overhead crane yeah you see exactly the this kind of opening on the other side where exactly this thing fits in and the the, the way the elements were lowered is in the end reasonably simple you had the crane you cannot really see this but the crane was built on on top of this this shaft all of the big detector elements, they were put on exactly the same kind of air cushions as before. Obviously, the cover was closed. Then they were put on the crane. They were lifted up very slightly. Then the cover was was opened, and then the, the, the elements would be descended into the cavern. And that means this pit had cover, and the, it needs to be so thick, because obviously also the very heaviest elements with 2,000 tons needs to be fully supported by this uh, this cover. Yep. So Eric, the crane is not there anymore because it was later on used uh, to put the roof on the stadium in in uh, in South Africa in yep. one of the stadiums for the for the World for the, Cup for the World Cup, Cup, uh, Cup for the soccer World I, Cup. I, I think that wasn't the only reason why it was removed, but uh, yes, I mean, oh, these no, are this is obviously very special this was, equipment. This was rented. You this rent device it. was rented. Yeah, there, but, there are a couple of three or four cranes of this on the whole world, and you have to reserve it years in advance. Exactly. Exactly. Back to the pit head cover. This is so massive that today we, we used to organize parties or even art uh, exhibitions on that. Okay, I yeah. think we, we should continue. Yeah, so the reception is very, yeah. very low. This is, this is one of the effects of turnover from Swisscom to French network and such. Yeah, exactly. But they will show up here in the room quite soon. Yeah. I so this brings us almost to the end. I don't see any open questions anymore. So did we answer everything you might think of? This is the last moment. So this <laughs> is the last moment you can still ask a question. So maybe I asked Eric to just give a short swipe over the control room. Yeah. And, and then we are really, really done. So if you have a last minute question, start typing. Yeah, one more comment. If you go to CERN to operate the detector, it's not unlikely that you spend many nights in front of the screens you see over there, yeah? Mm -hmm. Taking care of the proper operation of the detector and data taking. Yeah. So, so the screens here are quite dark right now, but all of these screens are showing something. So if you see the ones, uh, I don't know, uh, there. And it automatically goes to the tracker. Yeah. So these ones, yeah. these ones, 
this is where the shift leader is situated and he is uh, guiding what all the other peoples uh, do. The, the large collection which you see in my back where Eric and Noemi are just coming now. Yeah. So if you, you, if you could switch back again, then we have their view yeah. actually. I think I... Yeah, so just... this is the place of the shift leader. And then we have in total, we have five people, 24 hours, seven days a week which is a shift leader, a data quality manager, trigger shifter, data acquisition shifter, and the uh, detector security shifter. So these are five people. And then this, this large room, which is shown here, with all these screens for, for overviewing what happens with the detector, with our data, et cetera, and so on. So, so this is this is for the shift crew, assumption. and next to it there's a there's a sm somewhat smaller room where all the detector experts have their yeah. stations, where they can intervene in order to adapt something or correct a setting, uh, kill some channel which is noisy or, or whatever. And there's also a big button which is beam aboard, which you should not push just like this because then you will get a uh, well during beam. Of course, you get of course, questions. Of course. <laughs> and, and there's uh, a big. Could you show the big detector panel? Yeah, well, the problem is that the reception ah, is very, device. very, very bad this time. So, okay, I so think they are, maybe... they are the closest as possible, but the reception is the worst. Well, it depends on on which network they are yeah. connected. So it might happen yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you should turn back to the Wi-Fi. Here well, the wi that's what I tried and then it died. Oh, okay. The, okay, the so. last the last five seconds didn't work, so that is perfectly fine. This makes uh, about uh, below zero point one per mil that didn't work. That's fine. Well, now they are okay. So, I, if you want, you can try. yeah, I I set them up. Yes, now it is now it is much better. At least it moves. Resolution is not the perfect. You might see on the left side the the detector safety panel. So this is also part of the hardware safety system. We see at least at one glance, we see if anything is wrong. You know the physicist good is the green, physicist bad is the red. It is completely the opposite of the engineers. Um, and uh, yeah, exactly. What would be the perfect okay. intern be for you? What qualifications ah. are you looking for? Thank you for the questions. This is one of the most important questions. We need all kinds of engineers and all kinds of physicists. That's the answer. So we do need electronic engineer. We do need uh, 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 um, programming uh, software engineer. We do need as well mechanical engineer because you might saw these structures, these structures need to be designed, even modeled. Uh, and also we need physicists, of course. <laughs> so we need, we need physicists because they want to do something that nobody has done before and put everything to the extreme. And then we need en engineers to tell us what we actually can do. Maybe we can do everything, but they know how to. But, but <laughs> they know how to do safely. Safely, safely. oh yes, yeah. oh yes. And then we need to collect all the data. So we also need people who are looking into computing because exactly. all, all these pieces here behind us that do all the calculations, these are computers. Yeah. Okay. So Günther, I think that brings us to the end of this virtual visit. You have to unmute. Ah, yes, indeed. And yeah, okay. we saw a lot more than we would have seen in one of the usual tours around the detector. Eric, Noemi, thanks a lot for guiding us. Eric doesn't hear you at this moment. Uh, that's, uh, sorry. Ah. And Zoltan, thanks. You managed the background <laughs> perfectly. <laughs> uh, I'm really, yeah, it's, it was my pleasure to, to be with you. That was, uh, that was a very nice visit, I think. Um, Thanks so head, headsets and helmets do not go much big good together here. Well, actually, we had a we had a very nice uh, headset for for Eric. I hope yeah. he he enjoyed to use it as well. All right, so so thank, thank you very, very much. much, Zoltan and Noemi.
for doing this yeah, for our troop here. And Eric, yeah, famous hear. last words. You don't hear. No you don't hear anything. No, no. Yeah, worry. but that's good. That's, uh, but that's you good. won't hear Klaus here. You will hear only the outside. Okay. Anyway, I hope you, you, I could show you a bit and give you a bit of a small impression on how things look downstairs and I hope you, you enjoyed it. And uh, well, feel free, I guess, to, to pester the, the people in your lectures in case you have more specific questions. I'm sure they're, they're happy to, to answer that. And who knows, one of you or more, several of you might in the end end up here and uh, also be working on uh, one of these pieces of the detector. Okay, great, thanks. So some of the students now have another exercise simulating some silicon structures. And the rest of us, we meet on Tuesday, next lecture, yep. when there will mm -hmm. be a chance to continue asking questions or- With me then. Uh, yeah. Okay, then we say thank you and goodbye from, uh, from CERN from CMS. Thank you once again for the very, very nice organization and tours. And have a nice day. You too. Thank bye you. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye bye. No, it worked. Yeah, okay. There's, there's perfect silence over here. That was confusing.